Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today we're talking about collaboration in the divorce process and other things you might think are fantasies. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Seth Nelson with my good friend, Pete Wright. Our guest today is Dr. Jeremy Gaze, a licensed psychologist, certified family mediator, and a non-lawyer. He's been practicing here in Tampa for over 30 years and devotes his practice, as he says, to, quote, peacemaking for families. He's the author of A Clear and Easy Guide to Collaborative Divorce and Mindful Co-Parenting, two books and concepts we're thrilled to be able to discuss with Jeremy on the show today. Dr. Gaze, my good friend, welcome to How to Split a Toaster. Seth, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Pete, you don't know this about Dr. Gaze, but the real reason we have him here is his middle name is just outstanding. (laughs) (gasps) What is it? Ecclesiastes. Jeremy Seth Gaze. Oh, I should have seen that. I should have seen that coming. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, in namesake, he's he's here for, for your name, but also because he's another non-lawyer. And uh, that, as you know, I feel like I need to bolster my side of the team here today. A psychologist and a podcaster versus a lawyer. That's an even fight right there, I think. <laughs> Uh, we're talking about uh, we're talking about parenting, and we're talking about what you do, uh, Jeremy, in your work uh, and your work and your writing and your practice uh, when you're talking about uh, parent coordination and collaboration. And um, Seth spent some time this morning trying to educate me a little bit on uh, collaborative law and collaborative divorce. I wonder if you could actually teach us what these concepts mean. Absolutely. I mean, let's take a step back. The traditional way that people get divorced in the United States is by suing each other. They go to court. It's called litigation. It is not very family friendly. It's really not very humane. And there are better ways. So everything I do in my practice is about finding peaceful approaches to try to resolve disputes, to overcome obstacles, and to create a a new pattern for the family going forward. One of the ways that I do that is by working with parents on developing a co-parenting relationship. And I can do that with them if they come to me voluntarily, but sometimes they come to me through the court. And when they come to me through the court, especially when there's a high level of conflict, we call that process parenting coordination. Seth, what's your experience with uh, families and parenting coordination? I think it's outstanding to have these opportunities and what, from a litigation perspective, My duty is to zealously advocate for clients in the courtroom. But there are things that parents deal with on a daily basis that our court systems are not set up to handle timely, efficiently. Financially, it is outrageous the amount of money it will cost you to solve some of these issues. In going to a parent coordinator that is much more accessible and can help you bridge the divide and see things from different perspectives. The goal for a parent coordinator is to work together to reframe things. My goal is to go to court and get what my client wants. And that isn't always easy or it could be a very lengthy process. And we'll talk more about that on the back end of the show. But Dr. Gaze, what's an example of a problem that you think can be much more or easily handled in parent coordination as opposed to litigation? Well, that's an easy question because anything having to do with the family, with the children, with the roles of the parents, it's better dealt with outside of the court, working with someone who's an expert at dealing with family issues. So whether that's a matter of time sharing issues, where and when the children will spend time with each parent, whether it has to do with how the children will be exchanged, with which parent makes decisions for the children, how the children communicate with the parents. Uh, rules about uh, extracurricular activities, uh, rules even about when a parent wants to travel with the children. All of those decisions really should be focused on that particular family. You know, families aren't all the same, right? So every family deserves the opportunity to really consider what kind of plan, what kind of arrangement is going to work best for their children so that they can move forward in their lives in the best possible way. I can see Pete thinking, 
come on, Dr. Gase, these people are getting divorced. Is that what, Pete, what's going through your mind? I see it. Well, totally. No, I can tell you exactly, nailed it. I, it, you know, I, uh, with everything we've talked about, uh, about divorce and the, my experience with peers who have gotten divorced, the experience tends to start in, um, adversarial is, is probably a, a gentle term for it. it. It's an adversarial process, right? It's, it's uh, spy versus spy, you know, one versus the other. And that as soon as you get into the courts, as Seth already said, you know, the courts are set up to deal with this sort of adversarial approach to separation and to dissolution of marriage. And so my question for you is, how do you provoke a mood of collaboration when you're dealing with a family that is struggling to dissolve coming at it more aggressively? And that's a great question. Look, again, we just want to keep families out of the morass that is uh, the court system, because as soon as you step into a litigation process, as soon as you step into it, you have to, if you really want to fight that battle, you have to start digging things up and making allegations and painting a picture that uh, for each attorney is presenting their client in the best positive light. So as soon as you step a toe into the litigation process, you're already going down what I believe is a pretty dark road and a road that's just not right for families. So the first answer to your question, Pete, is uh, to try to get in as early as you can. So for parents who are contemplating a divorce, to reach out to a professional who is a peacemaker, who's going to help them try to find a way to co-parent without litigation, without having to get into some kind of a bloodbath, and to see if that would be a step that they're both willing to pursue. Likewise, for attorneys, when a, a client comes to an attorney and says, listen, I'm thinking about getting divorced, I have children, I would hope that every attorney in that first meeting, in fact, in the first 10 minutes of that meeting, would talk to those parents about the fact that there are better approaches. There are ways to resolve disputes without going into battle. So those are really two of the ways. Another way is for people to read. And there are a lot of ways to do this. You know, everybody's got a computer or a smartphone, and all you have to do is type in the words for a search about peaceful divorce um, or co-parenting after divorce, or uh, some keywords that we'll talk about in a little bit, collaborative divorce and it will put them on a better path right at the start. And on that on that note, Pete, to answer that question otherwise, some people are being thinking like, well, we need to just listen to Dr. Gaze. We don't need a lawyer. I was just going to say, at some point in his response, I think he called you a dingbat. You say? <laughs> yeah, you know, absolutely. <laughs> a dingbat that's going to stir the pot, make everything <laughs> horrible, drain 401ks and IRAs, and just do slash and burn. Now, in defense of my colleagues and of my profession. Well, let me defend let me defend your colleagues for a minute there, Seth. Oh, so outstanding. It really depends on the approach that the lawyer takes. So I know you well enough to know that you care about the people who come to you and you care about their children. And so you will always offer them the options to take a better path. And you're not hesitant to suggest that they meet with someone who can help them resolve any of disputes that, that can be resolved outside of court. That's the type of attorney that I'm really relying on for families. So it's not that all attorneys uh, lead folks into battle, but there are some attorneys who, as you've described, do, in fact, uh, look to stir the pot. What we're really trying to do is create a new culture within the family law uh, community, which is to focus on helping people find a peaceful path and not go right into war. The flip side of that is I will do everything I can to settle a case and give clients advice and counsel, but it really takes four people to settle a case. The parties have to be in agreement on whatever the settlement may be. Both the lawyers have to be advising their client that either one, that's a good settlement, you should take it. Yeah, you give and take. It's it's not everything you want. Or in the law, you might not get this in court, or you might not have to give this up in court, but there's still reasons to settle. So by way of example, in Florida family law, and remember, check your local jurisdiction, see what the laws are in your state and your jurisdiction, but a court cannot order a parent to pay for an 18-year-old's college education. It's okay in a settlement to say, I'm willing to pay for the college education, 
if that's going to help you get your case settled. Maybe you have the money set aside anyway. Maybe you were going to pay for it anyway. Maybe it's not that big of a deal or there's a 529 plan or it's already done, but we just want to make sure that's where the money goes. So there's things that you can do that you might not be required to do in court, but you can do it in a settlement. But if I'm going to court and they're asking for my client to pay for college education for an 18-year-old, I'm just going to say, oh, you're going to love this, Pete. Objection relevance, Your Honor. The court does not have the power. And judges love it when you tell them they don't have the power to do something. But the court does not have the power to order anyone in this courtroom to pay for an adult pers- adult child's college education. That, that's a power move. That's a courtroom power move right there. <laughs> yeah. All of those kinds of things that can happen in court, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, litigation is incredibly inefficient. Um, You know, if you want a document, you have to demand it, then it can be withheld, and then you have to demand it again, and then you might have to go to hearing just to get that document. In some of the processes that we're going to talk about in just a moment, including the collaborative process, asking for a document is as simple as saying, would you please give me this document? And the document is provided. In litigation, people have an incentive to make the other person look bad and feel bad and do bad. In some of the processes we're going to talk about that are more peace-oriented, the idea is not to tear down your co-parent, but to help build them up, to help them move on to their future life for the benefit of your children and for the benefit of the family. So maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about collaborative divorce. Well, I think it is because everything you're talking about, I mean, again, this sort of we have a a cultural understanding of divorce that is hide and uh, restructure and, you know, as you say, make everybody work for the documents we need to get. Uh, And so I think, you know, I'd love to hear about the process of collaborative divorce and frankly, how you build a culture of trust back into the divorce process. As a matter of fact, this morning, I had two separate meetings uh, with two different families who are just beginning the collaborative process. And I think both of these families are perfect examples of why this process is the right process for families. They're not looking to hurt each other. They certainly want to protect their children. And they want to try to do this in a way that's private, that's efficient, and that creates opportunities to create uh, arrangements that a judge would not be able to do and that would not result from litigation. So let me tell you about the collaborative process. Back in 1990, an attorney in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, named Stu Webb, started to feel uncomfortable with the way litigation was affecting his clients. And so he drafted a letter, sent it to a judge, and suggested what if the lawyers were to work more together, almost as co-participants in helping the couple reach a, a resolution. And this was the birth of the collaborative divorce process. Collaborative divorce is a process by which a couple, whether with children or without children, chooses, rather than going to court, to do an out-of-court arrangement using attorneys, generally attorneys who are trained in the collaborative process. They write up an agreement called a participation agreement that sets out the rules for the process. And as part of that agreement, they all agree that if anyone changes their mind and at any point decides to go to court and go into battle, that both attorneys have to step out of the process. Now, the reason for this is that it incentivizes everyone to stay at the table and to work cooperatively to reach an agreement. And 90% of collaborative divorces end up with a full resolution in Florida, 90%. Nationally, the numbers are in the high 80s, That's a very high percentage of people who reach a full resolution. They never have to stand in front of a judge. They never have to tear down their soon-to-be former partner. They don't have to spend inordinate amounts of money uh, to try to get to the end point. Isn't that a better way? No, because in litigation, 100% (laughs) ends in resolution, Dr. Gaze. Yeah, but but Seth, in, in, lit, in litigation, 100% of people come out beaten and battered, angry, frustrated, feeling victimized, feeling attacked. Well, now we're just arguing over which one is better and when, in which box are we going to check? Is it better to get a final resolution 100% of the time and take the risk of all those awful things? 
or 80%. But but remember, you're not really risking anything. If someone wants to go into the collaborative process, we always say the collaborative process has like an open door policy. You can always enter the process, you can always leave the process, and you can always come back. You know I'm just giving you a hard time. I, I agree with that 100%. And I would tell you that I'm a big believer in the collaborative process. It is a different way to approach the problem of figuring out what's best for your kids in the parenting plan, dividing up your assets and liabilities, figuring out if there's going to be alimony, what if any child support's going to be paid, how are the attorneys going to be paid. It is a different process. My only concern ever in the collaborative process is to make sure that the team, which would be uh, a mental health professional that usually is the facilitator, potentially a, an expert, a financial expert to deal with the money issues. One spouse has, and then their lawyer, and the other spouse and their lawyer. But those professionals need to be a group that can work well together. Because if one of them is not, that I think is then ripe for this process to fail and then cost people time and money, and then they have to go litigate. You're absolutely right. You, you need to have the right team. Now, there are different models of collaborative practice. You can do a collaborative divorce just with attorneys. You don't have to bring in additional professionals. But in most cases, it's recognized that bringing in a neutral financial professional and either one neutral coach, which here in Florida we call facilitator, um, sometimes it's called a neutral mental health professional. Uh, in other places, it's simply called, called a, a neutral coach. There's also a model that uses two coaches. Each spouse has their own coach. But in any case, using these adjunct professionals usually creates a lot of value for the process. You get a better result and you save a certain amount of money because each professional is doing what they do best. And the reality is that the neutral professionals tend to charge less than the attorneys. So there's some savings in, in that as well. But you're absolutely right. Look, the collaborative process is not right for every family. And one consideration is if you don't have a team of experienced collaborative professionals, then yes, the process may not go as well as if you have a team of, of experienced professionals. But there are some other exceptions to the rule. For example, if there are domestic violence issues such that one parent is coercive and controlling, or one spouse is coercive and controlling, that family may not be eligible for the collaborative process. If you have someone whose mental health or substance abuse issues cannot be resolved, even within the collaborative process, even with the support that we can offer them and, and the referrals we can direct them to, then in some cases, those families need to have a judge make final decisions. But those are the exceptions to the rule. The vast majority of families absolutely can benefit from the process and are very happy that they made that choice. What is your sense of attorneys who have sort of revisioned their incentive for working a divorce case through the collaborative process? When they go to litiga litigation, we kind of know what to expect. We know what they're what they're going to do, and we know the financial incentive. I'm assuming is there. What is their incentive in taking on a collaborative case uh, in in which they know they they're not going to be involved in litigation at all? Sure, it's a great question. Seth, I don't know if you've had this experience, but so many of the attorney colleagues that I have, they say that they got tired of fighting and beating people up and being uh, a part of uh, an outcome that wasn't didn't leave anyone feeling very good. And so I think, Pete, the, the primary motivation is that a lot of attorneys get to a point and they say, I just want to find a better way to help people. I got into this because I wanted to help people by understanding and, and uh, using the law to get justice and to protect people's rights. And they say that uh, this is a better way to do that. It is less stressful for attorneys because you're not constantly having to prepare uh, to argue every issue. It is much more collegial. Uh, the professionals learn from each other. It's much more peaceful. You're dealing with people who you're not always having to fight with. You're dealing with people who you're trying to work through to an agreement. And that's a very different experience. If they do the analysis on the front end and realize, hey, collaborative might be helpful, it's very results-oriented what is best. Now, in my practice, I'm always doing that anyway. I 
might get a call from an opposing counsel on a new case, and we might say, hey, I don't think we need to go a collaborative process because we can work well and cooperate with each other and not play the games on hide the document. Mm -hmm. And we call that more like cooperative. Now, if we have to go to court and our, our clients are not agreeing, then we can go to court. But there is a way within, quote, litigation that everything does not have to be a battle. That's true. For me, going into collaborative is sometimes a more difficult case than a lot of cases I have that I can work with the other lawyer and we work cooperatively and we might go to a mediation and finalize the deal and we're done. It might not need the collaborative process because we're going to work well together anyway. The more difficult cases sometimes require the collaborative process because even though the issues might be the same, there might be some really unique things in the family that I feel like I really need a mental health professional to help us deal with the different personalities. I try to be very clear with my clients. Here's the law. Here are your options. What are our choices? Let's come up with creative solutions. But sometimes a mental health professional can pick up on something that I might just be missing. Like, Seth, this person is still grieving. They're not ready to make the decision. In litigation, you, it, it comes a point Decisions will be made. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, hey, let's maybe take a step back. Let me go talk to this person. Let me bring them along at their pace. You can only go as fast as the slowest person. So there's just things like that that are nuanced that people like Dr. Gaze and his profession with those expertise can pick up on and then help resolve as opposed to me saying, well, sorry, we got a deposition. Let's go. Right, Seth, that's a great point. And I, I want to use that opportunity to say that e e collaborative divorce is not the only option for finding more peaceful resolutions. As you said, if you're working with another attorney um, who is going to work with you in a cooperative manner, that can be a very helpful outcome. I want to still advocate for uh, the consideration of involving a mental health professional in almost any divorce process. And the reason for that is that there are certain things that mental health professionals can bring to the table that other professionals are simply not their area of expertise, whether it's dealing with emotions, whether it's dealing with the grief of the divorce process, the anger, uh, the sadness, the fear of next steps, whether it has to do with parenting concerns or co-parenting relationships, or even if it's simply about drafting the parenting plan. So I have folks come to me, sometimes it's in my role as a parenting coordinator, or if they come to me voluntarily, I call that co-parenting consultation. It's the same thing, it just doesn't come with a court order. But in any case, I'm serving as a peacemaking co-parenting professional. And so even if they're going through litigation, attorneys can say, listen, let's not fight over the parenting matters, why don't you both meet with a parenting specialist who can help you find common ground, who can help you draft a parenting plan, and then we as attorneys will look at it and we'll tweak it to uh, make sure your rights are protected and to make sure it will have the best outcome. But bringing in a mental health professional in that type of role, I think can be tremendously helpful to family. Let's just focus on that for a minute too. It's not just people with kids. We talk a lot about kids in this process, but I've had people that without children or adult children that um, are not going to be involved in this. And what we do is we'll still do a collaborative process because they don't want to necessarily have the big war. And they're like, hey, how, how do we divide this? What happens if we own a business together that we're both still working in that business? Absolutely. One's back office, one's in the front. I would say that about a third of the families that I see in collaborative divorce uh, do not have shared children. And then another percentage have uh, adult shared children. Um, so we're not really having to focus on the parenting issues uh, per se, but the process offers the same benefits for them. It's a peaceful path to reaching a resolution. Dr. Gaze, do you have an example of a conflict and then how that would actually work? Because we're kind of talking in these big pictures, right? Sure. Where Pete's usually like, yeah, but Seth, when it's yeah, Christmas right. and the kid isn't dropped off, what am I supposed to do? He gives me, it, he says it and he tries to use like legal words, which is very cute. You and know? I do it really exceptionally well, is what we're saying. <laughs> so I've really adapted to the format and the form. 
I think that's I, I actually think that's a great question that, you know, to give us something a little bit more concrete to that where where, uh, you know, the the collaborative process actually resolves and sort of deflates a situation that a conflict situation that comes up in a divorce. Really, it, it's regardless of whether it's a collaborative divorce process or a parenting coordination process or a co-parenting consultation process where we're working with the parents, but there's not a court order. All of those are alternative dispute resolution methods. They're all peacemaking processes. So when it comes to uh, working out how to handle time sharing with children and holiday times and exchanges, it doesn't matter which of those processes we're talking about. The methodology is always the same. And really, the answer is going back in time. You, in other words, Seth, you don't wait until it's the eve of uh, a holiday. Um, to try to figure out what's going to happen. I love those text messages and phone calls I get on Christmas <laughs> Eve. <laughs> and sometimes they're going to happen no matter what you do. But if you do things right, and going back way to the beginning, you help parents develop a co-parenting relationship that is functional, is workable, is cooperative, has clarity, has guidelines, has boundaries, has rules, then those parents typically don't run into those kinds of problems on the eve of a holiday, because not only have they worked out a set of rules, which is what we call a parenting plan, but in addition, they have transformed their relationship as co-parents into something more functional, more workable, more cordial, more peaceful. So the work has to come in advance. Otherwise, what we're doing is we're going around putting out fires. And we know how effective it is for firefighters to just go where there's the biggest blaze and just pour water on it, if they don't start to uh, prevent fires and then control fires in the early stages, then they're constantly on duty in the middle of uh, a, a terrible situation. So we try to work with parents as early as possible to try to put them on a good path. Let's take a break. And uh, when we come back, we're going to transition to sending the collaborative process to litigation. But first... Let's define a term. For today, we're stepping away from Black's Law Dictionary, our old favorite, and we are moving into the Florida Laws and Rules 2020. So most jurisdictions are going to have a set of laws it's called statutes, and then there's also rules on how things get through the court process. So in your jurisdiction, talk with your lawyer to see if there's any rules of court that you should know about. Today, we have rule 12.285, mandatory disclosures. Subsection A, application. One, scope. This rule applies to all proceedings within the scope of these rules, except proceedings involving adoption, simplified dissolution, enforcement, contempt, injunctions for protection against domestic, repeat, dating, or sexual violence, or stalking, and uncontested dissolutions when the respondent is served by publication and does not file an answer. This rule goes on and on and on, and that part was just defining whether it applies or not. So I'm going to skip way ahead now, and I'm going to be all the way down at subsection three. Documents under this rule are not filed with court and sanctions. Except as for the financial affidavit and child support guideline worksheet, no documents produced under this rule shall be listed or filed with the court without first obtaining a court order. Skipping down even farther, I'm now at rule 12.285. Subsection B, time of production. Number one, temporary relief. Subsection A, subsection B. Then it goes all the way down to two. And then finally, it gets down all the way to subsection E, parties, disclosure requirements for initial and supplemental petitions. Here we go. One, financial affidavit. Two, all tax returns. Three, IRS forms. Four, pay stubs. Five, statements producing parties of any financial documents that have not been listed in the financial affidavit. Number six, all loan applications. Number seven, all deeds over the last three years. Number eight, all periodic statements for the last three months or all for checking accounts in 12 months for saving accounts or other accounts. Number nine, all brokerage accounts. Number 10, the most recent statements of any 401k, IRA, SEP. Number 11, deck pages 
of any statements or certificates of life insurance policies. Number 12, corporate partnership and or tax returns of trust tax returns or ownership interest if you own more than 30% of the corporate entity. Number 13, all promissory notes for the last 12 months. Number 14, all written premarital or marital agreements. Number 15, all documents of tangible evidence supporting producing claims. 16, any court orders directing the parties to pay or receive spousal support or child support. And I truncated it. So 12.285 is literally a very extensive list of all the documents in Florida family law in an initial divorce case that you have to go find and give to the other side. Talk to your lawyer. Okay, so we've already teased that at some point there is a percentage of uh, divorce cases that end up going into litigation. The first thing on my mind here is how does having been through the collaborative process impact the litigation experience? It's rough. Oh, outstanding. Okay. Because you're inheriting something that you had nothing to do with in the in, in, during the collaboration process. Exactly. So I get a call and it says, I was in collaborative law. It didn't work. I know I've got a rough ride ahead of me. I will start with how far did we get? Did we get a parenting plan? Did we, if you don't have kids, did we get the assets divided, but we're arguing about alimony? So you, you see where we are, mm -hmm. how much information was exchanged and documents um, for financial reasons, which in Florida we call mandatory disclosures, which will relate that definition that I just gave you on section or rule 12.285. And that's a very long list. How far did you get in that? Was it given over nicely or not? Let's give an example of the difference between a collaborative law request for a document and a litigation request for a document. So I'm gonna have Dr. Gaze go first. In collaborative law, if you would like to get the tax returns for the last three years, how, what is the process when your client does not have access to them, doesn't know where they are, doesn't even know if their name was on them, if they filed joint or separate, how do you get the last three years of tax returns? Great. I'm so glad you're asking that question, Seth, because that really touches on one of the pillars of the collaborative process, which is called transparency. Transparency means everything goes out on the table. So uh, I want all of your listeners to listen very carefully as I explain the very complicated process of receiving a document in the collaborative process. It goes like this. May I please have that tax document? Yes, I'll be happy to send it to you by Friday. Thank you very much, period. That's how it works in the collaborative process. And if it doesn't show up on Friday, the last three years tax returns, what do you do? Okay, so if it doesn't show up at the time that it was agreed to, um, then that's where I, as the facilitator, would typically step in and I would speak with the professional team, speak with the attorneys and find out what happened. Why was it not received? In more cases than not, there was just some oversight or it wasn't sent by the accountant in time or there's just some kind of glitch, which is why my role as uh, a facilitator is to help facilitate the smooth transition of processes and all the mechanisms. So typically we can resolve that with a quick email or with a phone call. If in a very rare circumstance, and I'm gonna tell you in my experience of doing this for 10 years, this would be a really rare circumstance where for some reason that spouse or their attorney are saying, well, we've decided we don't really wanna release that document. What happens is that the professional team meets and we discuss the principles of the collaborative process. We discuss the agreement that was signed, that participation agreement. We discuss the ethical standards of collaborative process. And if it comes to that, that usually gets us over uh, the top. If for any reason it doesn't, what it's telling us is that either that spouse or their attorney has not made what we call a paradigm shift, where they understand that this is a different process with different rules and expectations and different obligations. It's extremely rare that we get to that point. But if we do get to that point, then there is the possibility that the collaborative process would need to end. 
Okay, you ready for how I do that? Please. <laughs> okay, okay, buckle so, up. Buckle up. Here we go. Now, we don't have enough time in the podcast to explain every little bit. So I'm going to try to save this, say this very quickly to capture every little step. Follow, this is all in Florida. It, check your local jurisdiction. File for divorce within 45 days after process, service of process. All these documents are required. They're called mandatory disclosures under 12.285. I do not receive the documents from the other side. I have to write a 10-day letter saying, Dear lawyer, I did not receive your client's mandatory disclosures last three years of tax returns. Please provide them within the next 10 days or I will file my motion to compel. I don't receive them in the next 10 days. I file my motion to compel. We file it with the court. We then have to clear a date for a hearing for the judge to listen to our motion to compel the last three years of tax returns. So we have to get it on the judge's calendar. Once we get the judge's calendar, we have to clear it with the other side, clear it with their calendar. We send them three dates. Of course, they're unavailable on our three dates. So now we go back to the judge's calendar. We get three more dates. Now we're about three months out. We send them out to the other side. They agree. Now that we agree, we have to wait for our motion to be heard. We have to do a notice of hearing saying that on this date and time, we're going to hear my motion to compel to get the last three years of tax returns. And we cleared it with the lawyer on this date. So when we get to court, the other lawyer can't say, oh, you didn't clear this date with me. And we also put on the bottom whether we're going to have a court reporter, that little stenographer writing everything down to say what happens. Then we go to the hearing and the judge looks at us and says, why are we here? These are mandatory. Sir, you have 10 days to turn these over. Your Honor, thank you very much. I've also asked for attorney's fees that I've had to waste all this time to get something that was mandatory. Can I have my attorney's fees? I'll take it under advisement, Mr. Nelson. For now, I'm withholding ruling on attorney's fees. Now, it's 10 days later. Do I get those documents? Maybe not. If I don't, what do I have to do? Motion to compel and a motion for <laughs> sanctions for violation of a court order. I file my motion. Now it's a violation of an order. What do I do when I file my motion, Pete? Got to clear it with the other side. Get with the judicial assistant on the judge's calendars. We got to clear those dates. Nope, we're not available. We get more dates. Then we clear those dates. And then we do our notice of hearing again. And we come all the way back. And now we're four to six months out. And Dr. Gay's got them by Friday. I like his way better. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 sounds, it sounds a lot better. And But if I put myself in the position, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking about a divorce. Is there something I should be on the lookout for that's a, potentially a leading indicator that says the collaborative process is going to fall apart and I'm going to lit litigation? How do I know if it's not working? And it sounds to me like this is a question of good faith. You know, I may not know art, but I know what I like kind of a thing. You'll know it when you see it. Yeah, it's absolutely a matter of good faith. So if you are a spouse and you're considering the collaborative process, but you absolutely, completely do not trust your soon to be. Uh, ex-spouse, um, and you feel that your soon-to-be ex-spouse is not in any way going to operate in good faith. And in addition, if you feel that your soon-to-be ex-spouse's attorney is not going to be operating good faith, then the collaborative process is not going to work for you. I mean, we can't we can take uh, unreasonable circumstances or unreasonable people and all of a sudden get to a resolution. But the vast majority of people aren't like that. They may be angry. They may be frustrated. They may be scared. They may be difficult people. We deal with difficult people all the time in collaborative divorce. And I'm not just referring to Seth here. Difficult <laughs> spouses. Touche. Wow, he, that he was good. He made the joke before I could get to it, man. <laughs> that was impressive. <laughs> you know, really, um, this process, it is not perfect. It is not for everybody. But it is a godsend for the families who are reasonable, who want to get to a resolution, who don't want to spend the six to eight months just to get the tax document uh, that Seth's scenario described, they just want to get the tax document. They want to use that information mm -hmm. so that they can start to figure out how they can divide up their assets and, and their debts, and they can work out a spousal support arrangement and a child support arrangement. The collaborative process typically takes, it depends where you're, you're doing the work, but on a national basis, about seven months or so. Whereas a typical litigated divorce is more like 17 months. And now with COVID, because of the difficulty of getting into the courthouse, it can be dramatically longer than that. What I want to make a real important point is it's not just the frustration that comes with those delays. It's not just the incredible costs that come with those delays. 
during the whole process of litigation, what is happening to this family? And what's happening is they're getting torn apart. It is very hard for parents to cooperatively co-parent after a litigated divorce, whereas after a collaborative divorce, it's usually very, very easy because the collaborative process isn't just transactional, right? Litigation is pretty much transactional, right? You're trying to figure out who gets this and who gets what and who gets this time. The collaborative process is transformational. We are not just looking to resolve uh, uh, you know, a checklist. You get this amount, you get that amount. We're also looking to help restructure this family in a way that they can move forward with their independent lives as adults and with their life as co-parents. That's a big difference. You're talking about how people co-parent after a litigated case. And let's say even if it resolves in mediation, it can still be difficult. But cases that go to trial typically are going to be back in front of the court again. It's almost as if the fear of the courtroom is gone. Like, oh, I've been through that. I can do that again. I find that people that have gone to trial are more apt to be back in front of a court, of a judge trying to get a re- resolution to whatever the issue is, as opposed to saying, oh, I don't want to go in front of a judge. Uh, it's like they're abdicating responsibility for making their own decisions together. A little bit. There could be. Or it's just like, hey, I've been to a trial. I know what it's like yeah. now. It worked out really well for me last time. Let's try that. I'm not even going to bother trying to, I can never work this out with her. I can never work this out with him. Why am I even going to bother to try? Let's go to court. Let me give you a great example here. I I work as a collaborative facilitator, but I also work as a parenting coordinator. Uh, The folks who come to me for parenting coordination tend not to come to me early in the divorce process because they're typically referred by the court, by their attorneys. And usually that doesn't happen until later in the litigation process or sometimes post litigation. So when I'm working as a parenting coordinator, in most cases, I'm doing cleanup. I'm taking two folks who have already been beaten up and battered and have beaten up and battered each other, and I'm trying to get them to work cooperatively together. It's not very easy. When folks start the process and they have professionals who have the wisdom to direct them to a peacemaking professional early in the process, we can help them establish that kind of positive relationship and save them all of the suffering and all of the destruction to their potential relationship that comes from going through litigation. That's what I'm pleading And for. I'm not advocating the litigation on this, Dr. Gaze, but I do want people to hear because I know what they're thinking out there. I could do that, but not my spouse. So you have to really do a gut check on can you really do it? But also, like Dr. Gay says, if there is someone that where there's been domestic violence, there's serious control issues, if you know that your spouse is hiding money and is totally controlling on every aspect, these are not the cases we are talking about. Right. No right. way do I think Dr. Gaze is saying every single case should be collaborative. We don't need those stinking lawyers. No, okay. absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, we, we need those stinking lawyers, Seth. We really need them. <laughs> so, so <laughs> and, and look, some of my best friends, uh, you know, uh, we're stinking uh, lawyers. We're really, stinking lawyers. Stinking, yeah. No, no, they're they're wonderful uh, officers of the court. Um, but you're you're absolutely uh, right. I am a strong advocate for the collaborative process and for other peacemaking processes. However, I am also a very vocal advocate for screening families before they enter either of these processes. Why? Because we want to avoid the very problem that you and Pete were sort of uh, speaking about. Is we don't want to just say, "Oh yeah, everybody come on in, we'll fix everything." Because if you come in and you don't have the intention of of resolving the matter, then we might actually be making things worse. So we do a screening very early on. And a lot of lawyers, before they even start the collaborative process for a family, they will send the spouses to me to do a screening. I call it an open consultation. So I'm not serving in any formal role. I'm just going to educate them about divorce processes. And I'm going to find out which processes they're good candidates for. And then I can give them that feedback and I can give their attorneys that feedback. That helps avoid putting people in the wrong box, one that they're not really ready to pursue. Just like when you have to go get, am I, can I get LASIK or not, doc? You got to go get the screening. You don't just show up at the operating table. (laughs) That's right. That's right. 
That's right. <laughs> That's right. Besides, you know, you got a, that sweet 90% success rate right now. You got to protect that. You know what, Absolutely. though? Absolutely. I was just talking to my <laughs> uncle, who's a doctor. So we have this yeah. whole doctor lawyer thing going. Oh, that sounds fun. And I said, I've never lost a divorce case. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I've never lost a divorce case. Every divorce case I've ever had, I've won. I'm that good. <laughs> and my uncle goes, I just, I'm a smart guy. So, and I, I don't even want to give you credit that you're a smart guy. Explain. I'll bite. Why? I said, look, they came to me. They were married. They, they wanted a divorce. I got them divorced. They don't have any of their money or any of their kids' time anymore. I got them divorced. I won. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, in your in your defense, Seth, uh, I'm going to note that uh, from my experience, uh, you not only get them divorced uh, despite any other results that, but you probably do tend to um, win in the regard in regard to the fact that when you litigate, you're a very good litigator, and you probably make your clients happy in terms of they got what you can get in litigation, but. The deck is stacked against you and against them because no matter what the outcome is in litigation, they will bear the cost, the scars, and all the negative impacts of having gone through the litigation, no matter what the outcome is, and their children will suffer that as well. So that's why I say that there are no winners in litigation. Well, I'll tell you, I I feel like the road to this episode was paved with good intentions. We have this fantastic resource in Dr. Gaze, and we talked about exactly one major topic that was on our agenda, which I think means uh, you're going to have to come back sometime. It would be my pleasure. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. Great conversation. Before we let you go, where would you like to send people who want to learn more about you, your work? the collaborative divorce process, your books. Uh, it's, it's your, the stage. What do you like for your birthday? <laughs> well, actually I'm, I'm not really that concerned about uh, folks content, contacting me directly. I'm, I'm busy as it is. They're certainly welcome to reach out to me and you can just Google my name, Jeremy Gaze. It's spelled G A I E S. But I do want to direct uh, folks to a couple of resources that might be helpful. There are two books that I've written that uh, are pretty good resources, and they're they're pretty cheap. One's called Mindful Co-Parenting, A Child-Friendly Path Through Divorce. And the other book is called A Clear and Easy Guide to Collaborative Divorce. They are both available on Amazon in paperback, uh, Kindle, and an audio book. If you want to actually hear my voice uh, narrating, you're welcome to do that as well. There are some websites that I direct people to. If you're interested in collaborative uh, divorce, the International Academy of Collaborative Professionals is a good resource. That's the umbrella organization for all collaborative professionals. And they have some good resources on their website. And that uh, website is collaborativepractice.com, collaborativepractice.com. Thank you so much for your time today. Dr. Gaze, uh, you are a credit to your field. Thanks for not being an attorney. <laughs> Thank yeah, you I all. think the uh, non-attorneys won today. Chalk up, <laughs> chalk up the win. <laughs> Seth, uh, always a treat to talk to you, sir. On behalf of Dr. Jeremy Gaze and Seth Nelson Esquire, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll catch you next time right here on How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with Nelson Coster Family Law and Mediation with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, how to split a toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of Nelson Coster. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.